faith hopes for this life also. But note well, by virtue of the absurd, not by virtue of human understanding. Otherwise, it is only common sense, not faith. The divine inhabits and finds its task in the finite. To what reality am I obedient? Where do I find guidance for my life? Am I fundamentally guided by and obedient to my likes, my cravings, my desires, my wishes, my feelings, the direction of my friends, colleagues, or peer group? Does financial gain and security or political persuasion direct my day-to-day -day decisions? Am I compelled to follow the direction of my rational intelligence and scientific discernment as my ultimate authority? Upon what foundation does my hope, my trust, and the decisions that shape my life rest? It is easy enough to see that only one thing remains which can interest the one for whom everything is equally significant and equally insignificant, obedience. This is the absolute majesty. But this conception of the majesty of God and of obedience does not really please us human beings. Therefore, we have managed to get it abolished and have permitted ourselves to pretend that we are able to trick God into distinctions. And it is so frightfully rigorous to have to deal with God in this way that only obedience interests this one and therefore the all, all, all most insignificant things can interest this one. However, the first way is a belittling of God's majesty and only the latter is the expression for God's majesty. What is motivation? So let's do a little motivation experience. I'd, I'd like you all to become calm and centered. Okay? Take a couple of deep breaths. Now I'd like you to, um, now you can keep your eyes open for this particular experience, but I'd like you to, with your mouth, close your mouth very tightly. Yeah, is everybody doing it? Okay, keep your mouth very tightly shut. And now I would like you to take your non-dominant hand and very tightly hold your nose. <laughs> if you're laughing, you're not doing the exercise. Okay, now, with your other hand, when you begin to experience some motivation to breathe, then I'd like you to raise your hand. But if you don't experience it yet, then keep your hand down. Okay, and then once you have experienced motivation, then you can put your hand down and, and start breathing again. <laughs> Did we all experience a little motivation? This motivation is interesting stuff. You may wonder, where does it come from? It comes from having an end, a terminus. That's where drive comes from. That's where motivation comes from. That's where consciousness comes from because it creates a tension. Now, my guess is that just a few minutes ago, before our little experience, my guess is that you weren't thinking about breathing, were you? You, weren't, you were just assuming that there was this infinite abundant supply of air and that it was just going to stick around forever, right? But now you got a little consciousness. We got a little consciousness because we experience a little finiteness, a little contingency, a little limitation. That's where it's that tension. Now, finiteness, limitation, contingency also creates something else that we're going to talk about as the, the human centered wish. The human centered wish. And the human-centered wish, it is also a result of the fact that, that we're contingent. This human-centered wish, it is branded on every DNA strand, in every cell, in my body, and in your body. It's just part of the package. 
And the human-centered wish is simply this. It's the wish or the hope that life will not be like life is. That life will be some other way. And if not now, then someday it'll be different. Once I finish that dissertation, once I get that job, once I marry the right one, once I divorce the wrong one, once I lose those 20 pounds, once the Cubs win the pennant, once IU has a winning football team, then life will be okay. And so we live our lives not living our lives. We live our lives getting ready to live our lives someday, sometime, some other set of circumstances and not now, which is the only place we can ever really live our lives. So this human-centered wish is a tricky little thing because we all got it. Can't get, you never get old enough not to have it. You're never, uh, there's no moral exercise you can go do to rid yourself of it. Contextual ethics is a good symbol for what attuned working means. It means letting in the real reality you're having to deal with and understanding as best you can and then making some decisions that are uh, attuned to the reality you're living with, uh, the people you're living with, the, the world situation you're living with. Uh, I love a piece of scripture that is put in the mouth of Jesus by the gospel writer of John. Uh, it goes like this. My father's working and I am working. This is you know, a symbol of the authentic person saying this. The, the final mystery is working here and I am working in attunement with the working of this final mystery. That's what I mean by attuned working. And it means being beyond fate. That is, people say that global warming cannot be solved. They're just going to give into it and sail to their doom as best they can. <laughs> no. It's living beyond fate. There is no final answer as to how things can, can outcome. Uh, I can be attuned to the possibilities in my situation in a way that the world around me is refusing to acknowledge. And it means obedient implementation. Uh, it's strange to talk about obedience as a part of freedom. But that's this kind of obedient implementation of attuned working in the situation you have on your hands is freedom. It's the creative end of freedom uh, to create life and to create life in my times. Trust in the ultimate mystery of reality with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. Seek this greater will in all you do, and it will direct your paths. To Soren Kierkegaard, the leap was always experienced as a terrifying risk. It demands a radical decision. Finally, one must leap. In the leap, one can talk about the leap of faith when one is actually in the air, so to speak. There is no faith to Kierkegaard without the act, the leap. In the leap, one has grounded the self transparently in the power that constituted it. In a real sense, one becomes at one with the power, trusting it with one's life. This is grounding faith in actuality rather than in some theory or doctrine which usually requires no risk. Faith is only the individual's faith as he or she leaps. Faith is walking face first and full speed into the dark. When reflection is completely exhausted, then faith begins. I am discovering some guidance upon an invisible path. 
an infinite path meandering through my own heart and binding me with an all-pervasive mystery. I am slowly connecting with a contentless center. I sense this center is trustworthy beyond all else. Meander with me. <laughs>